Good morning, you guys. <laughs> Let's do this really quick. Um, if anybody wants to give by cash or check, go ahead and raise your hand. And everybody else, thank you. You can, there's the number they're going to put up there, and you can just text an amount. We'll get you on file. Thank you guys for your faithfulness. Are we on air? Are we on? All right. Thank you for giving. Alex, you want to go ahead and come on up here? We're growing. Thank you for writing in, people that have written in. It's such a blessing to hear um, your stories. Um, get in there sometimes, you guys, get in the comments and respond to the, the, these people. Get to know these people from all over. Um, because we're all the same. Are y'all awake? Kinda. You're gonna be wake, woken up. All right. Alex is gonna help me. We're gonna talk about exactly what we were just singing about. Stuff bugs me. Sorry when I start. Um, so the number's still up there. If you want to give, thank you for that. So you guys know that in the beginning we were created in the image and likeness of God. The image being the physical part of man, the likeness, the nature of God. That's, it's, it's in the beginning, meaning in the, fo the forefront, in God, we're still being created in that, matured in that. We're literally on the earth. Anyone else, these guys are walking around. Oh, take your money. Any <laughs> we're literally on the earth to be matured in our likeness. To the level that we're maturing in our likeness is the level that we'll have fellowship with God. In other words, he's going to speak our language when we're young, and as we're mature, we're going to learn to speak his language. That's why sometimes you can hear things and it's so far out of your mind, don't resist it. In time, God's going to mature you to understand it and to be able to dialogue with it. And it's beyond language that's taught by man. And the more I'm learning, I'm just beginning to learn um, some things in, like with Aramaic and I'm realizing how limited language is. Have you guys ever really been fully misunderstood by somebody? Somebody that you love? Somebody that knows you? You know, and, and you just like, you just, you're like, oh, that's not what I meant at all. Like you misre either you misrepresented yourself or they misinterpreted. And that's the limitation of the languages of man. That's, it's really easy to do in text, isn't it? <laughs> or on Facebook. Like you're writing something, you think it's good news, and people take it like a punch in the stomach, and you're like, whoa. <laughs> right? So we're, we're here and we're being matured in the likeness, which is agape. The, the, the love that continues, the vastness that's inside of us. Um, even when we say love, it sounds so weak because we throw that word around. So the word agape is whenever we're talking about God's kind of love. It never stops. It just keeps coming. It just keeps coming. There's no condition. There's no limits. It's the spaciousness of God. Okay? That is the nature that's inside of us. There's another, there's another nature, if you want, if, and it's just the nature of man, Right? that is being redeemed and healed. It was redeemed and, and completely made whole in Christ, in Jesus, and now we're walking it out in our lives, right? And it, it's the, um, the nature of man. And in it, when he, when he was talking about being renewed, we can take that mind of man, we can take the mind, your thoughts were formed by culture, by raising, by when you were born, by your gender, by your experiences, okay? That's, that's what our thoughts are formed by, okay? We, and, but our mind has already been made new, made whole, sozo. He made us completely whole, spirit, soul, and body, and we're walking out. We're being awakened to our wholeness, okay? So to renew our mind is to bring our mind back to the beginning, which is God. Not on the linear line of history, back in the beginning, back to the beginning, your original state is only whole. You, there, it's only whole. You are completely whole. You are made righteous. You are perfected in Christ. Do you have a marker in your hand? We'll see if this marker works. So we have image. 
And then we have likeness. And likeness is, we're talking about natures. And the likeness is agape. Agape describes the nature of God. It's not based on what we do. How who he is is who he is is who he is. Is who he is is who he is is who he is. <laughs> and so what we're going to experience in this life um, comes down to wh where we're going to source our energy. Okay? So the, it's the thing, you know, when we go back and forth with the tree of life and this, it all comes down to source or what energizes my life. Energy. Energy. Eyes. <laughs> okay. What energizes my life. So listen, it's going to come down to if, if I am unaware of my truest nature, which is love. If I'm not, when I'm not allowing love to be developed in me, the English word for that would be fear. And, and I don't like it because we, we know what all these words mean already. Okay, we, what they mean to us. All right, so it, let's look at this really quick. I'm not, I won't go very long, Alex, and we'll bounce back and forth. So Genesis 3.10, if you can throw that up on the board, you guys know what's happening here. Um, Adam and Eve did their own thing. And then they hid. When God came to fellowship, God's always looking for us. God's coming after us, and he's coming after us, and he's coming after us. And so here God is coming after man to fellowship with man. And he said, where are you? Like, where'd you go? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. That word afraid is a Hebrew word. And uh, the words in Hebrew really describe more of a feeling. There's not just an en one English word that it would be like you describing how you feel. It, it really, it, it represents the flowing in the gut. Like he's describing his senses were open to a world, a, a carnal world. Senses beyond, um, he began to be governed or he activated senses that weren't just governed out of the, the, the spirit or fellowship with God. And he said, you, you came looking for me, and I was afraid. It, I felt something in my gut. It was a flow in the gut. He's, he's describing a way of feeling of terror or fear. Okay? Let's look at um, 1 John 4, 18, when it talks about in the, in the New Testament that there's no fear in love. That's a Greek word for fear. It's, it comes from the word phobia, and that means Separate. To withdraw. When you're afraid, some of you may have had a parent that you were afraid of as a child, you want to withdraw. Okay, it's real. Um, let's see, it means withdraw, separate, terror. So when it talks about that there's no fear in love, that, is, that word love is agape. There's no withdrawing in agape's nature. There's only union in agape's nature. You're one with the field, you're, you're in the field, the vastness of his glory, and there, that you don't even feel the urge to withdraw, okay? So we're talking about fear and love, but try to open your mind to the definitions that are beyond what we've understood fear and love to be, okay? So Because one, one of these, did you get the marker? <laughs> this one, and thankfully so, is going to speak of limitation. This is the relationship that has boundaries. You cross this boundary and I'm going to treat you different or I'm going to withdraw from you. And we call it love, but it really is fear. See, we call go evil good when we're living from the carnal source. And we don't even realize we're doing it. Okay? You do A, B, and C, and then I love you. This is a conditional. It, it, you can actually love from this place with what we would call love, but it has conditions. And as soon as you give love conditions, it's fear. You know, I heard somebody say, um, I would stay with them until they had an affair, and then it's over. Well, that's your boundary. That's your condition. So that's the limitation of your love. And I remember telling him, I'm like, I don't know what I would do. I would want to leave. 
Of course, your emotions want to respond in fear, but I would want to renew my mind because when, when I marry Darren, God, God said he's the one. So in it, I, I yielded to, to the, the agape nature. I yielded to what God said. So if I'm now faced with a crisis, a boundary that I would like to set, because I want to, you know, ego, this is where the ego is birthed, and ego always wants to protect itself. So ego's love is conditioned on self. So in that, I remember telling that person, even though I would, my mind would want to agree, the carnal man would want to agree, because if you're hurt, what do you want to do? You want to withdraw, okay? But I don't want that to be the energy of my life. I, I, th- I, th- um, I remember saying, when we get there, I'll, I would have to go to God and hear. I would have to bring this condition that I want to set because I want to, you, you know, you're kind of a smart person if you keep covering your face when you get hit, right? But then when you're moving into a place of love and trust, true love, agape love with God, it's this vastness. There's no fear in it. And so you take the tendency to, to hide and protect the phobia, what fear means to withdraw, you take it that's in our minds, it's in all of our minds, and you bring it to the, the vast, spacious place, which means holy. And in the spacious place, the redemption of our mind begins. Does that make sense? Is that a lot? So it comes down to source. Um, let me be- you got some things you want to say right now? Okay. So religion, now I know we don't think we have it, but all of us have it, okay? Um, even if you weren't raised. Okay, so religion will operate from image, from carnal, natural self, senses, sensual self. This is, I mean, we could build a really, really big church if we serve the senses, okay? So the carnal, sensual, it, religion, in my, I don't know if you guys can read this, but religion will take you from this space and help you try to get to agape you're from carnal trying to get to something that's always religion in our mind okay what we're realizing is that we're whole already we're not moving towards wholeness the wholeness is is within us and we're being awakened to the wholeness the vastness of god is within us and we're being awakened to the vastness Sometimes I told, I, um, I told you guys there's, when I was getting in my head about with Belinda, we celebrated yesterday the celebration of life for Belinda. If you didn't, if you weren't a part of it, I would love to get uh, the clips of when Betty spoke and Louie spoke because it was incredible, wasn't it? I mean, there was more life in that. <laughs> we, we, we had to remind people this is not a funeral. And people were so open and just blown away. So much life, so much life. But religion or carnal relationships cause you to work from them to get to love, working for love, okay? When we are the created being, the, who we are, the uncreated part of us, we go to, we, I'm going to do this backwards, <laughs> from to. We work from our likeness, we into our carnal mind, and we bring redemption, Literally within you is the answer to every situation that you're struggling with. The redemption is within. Say that. The redemption is within. It's already there. It's already there. And see, what the lie is, the, the lie is we keep the redemption outside of our reach. So we're looking for the next revelation. We're next, looking for the next book. We're next, looking for, it used to be, I don't know, I'm sure a lot of places still do that. The next touch. I was telling somebody, uh, I think Ann, um, guys, when we moved here, God told Darren not to operate in his gift. Before that time in the church, it was like long, long altar calls. You, any of you guys been part of those? Hours upon hours upon hours. And they're powerful, and people are laying around and getting touched by God and prophetic words, and, and that's how church was. Everyone would come up and, and get a touch. Okay, but then God um, collectively or corporately started maturing his people. And the awakening is from within. And we realize that the answer isn't outside of ourselves, the answer is within ourselves. 
and we begin to mature and we're empowered, okay? So when we live from this space, it, life is happening to us. What, circumstances happen to us, and we feel like we're a victim of life. Right. And from this place, life is happening by us. We are co-creating. There's nothing left to blame. And I don't mean, I'm not just talking about um, just our, my small world, what's been created. I'm talking about, I'm talking to sons and daughters in the earth, people that can hear my voice online, those of you that you know God is maturing you. You know God's maturing you when you get to that another empty field and you feel afraid and you stay there. <laughs> I went through about two weeks. At, I'm like, okay, God, we got to shorten this time. Sheila, you stubborn thing, right? I told you, fear started hitting me when I, when I realized that Belinda was going to transition. Fear was hitting my mind on picking up the pieces here and the pain. I know the pain. I know the pain. And so fear started hitting my mind, and it's that restricted place, those voices. It's busy, and I paid attention to it and gave reality to it, and I got really sick. Okay? And then you guys, those of you guys that have had COVID or just been really sick, you get even more victimized <laughs> in your mind. You're even more weepy. Some, life is happening to you. All the, all the, all the time I'm getting really quiet and I, I'm, go, I'm beginning to go to the vastness, the spacious place, the holy place. The alchemy can begin there. Alchemy. We're going to learn a lot about that. When she, when she did transition, Laura messaged me that day and asked me if I'm okay. Because these guys had just went through it. And, went th and Ron had just went through it. And Marcus, you had went through it. I mean, we just had been, are you okay? It's like you brace yourself, right? Because you know. But by that time, I already was through it. I'm in this vast place of peace. And Louie, her son yesterday, Belinda's son, Belinda and Danny's son, talked about this space of peace. And you can't argue with peace. You cannot argue with peace. Because you know when you're in the restricted place in your mind, and you know when you're in the field, the vastness of peace. And that's when you just want to run around like a little kid naked. No consequences. There's no rules. Put your shirt back on. There's one rule. That's a commercial. <laughs> Do you want to say anything along that line? Uh-huh. All right. Yeah. And can I erase some of these things up here? Okay. No, it doesn't. This. You can relate all of it. No, because it's right along the lines. So I'm just going to break down what she's saying from a different perspective. And the way I'm going to say it is not matter of fact, but hypothetical. What if? Because I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm here to encourage you to think for yourself. And um, I read this the other day. And when I read it, it just hit me. It hit me really hard. That, um, and it said, hypothetically, God is not the creator. He is only the source. Humans are the creators. So if God, and we're going to put this right here, whatever you want to call it, God, the creator, the source, this is who we are. In the beginning in Genesis, when it talks about let there be light, that's actually when we were hypothetically first created. When, they, when he said, let there be light, he was talking about you. And then he created human nature. He created what we would call the ego or humanity. And it was always designed for Eve to hear that voice. In fact, it was even the source's voice speaking to her. Because without seeing limitation, you can't experience limitless. Without experiencing fear, 
You can't experience love. You have to have both. And God said that he made us within his image. God's image can see both. So he had to be able to give the gift to humanity, to human, to the human nature, to be able to see both, or we wouldn't be in, in likeness of God. We wouldn't be in God's image if we weren't able and capable of experiencing both. And so it was always, it was always the plan for Eve to hear that voice. It was always the plan. It was always the plan for her to step into that humanity, make that decision, and then be removed from Eve or from the garden, and then to live this life out of a human place. But even in the Old Testament, they were still creating their world. There was lots of death. There was destruction. You know, they're worshiping God. They're sacrificing. But they were still creating that. That wasn't, God, that wasn't the source creating that. That was human nature creating that. And then Christ came and said, remember who you are. Your source. You're not just a creator, but your source. And so then Christ comes and he releases that to us. And then it brings us back to the source. And all of a sudden, we realize source is within. We're no longer creating this source outside of who we are, making these sacrifices. We realize source is within. And we start creating from source instead of humanity. We start creating from source instead of human nature. And so hypothetically, in the garden, it was almost like two strands of DNA. Source's DNA, human nature DNA. And Eve chose human nature DNA and chose to create from that space. And creating from that space clouded her eyes from seeing that she was always originally from the source. But she was still, they were still creators. They were still creating their world. Christ comes and releases that. And, and their eyes are open to the fact that source was always within. And now here we are, and, and we're coming back to source. Everything in this room, as you look around, everything that we see in here was created by humans. When we go outside, everything that we see is created by humans. Nature, the element, that is source. That is, crea that was, that is from the source. That is source. They are elements given to us to help us create because we were always the creators. And source breathes life onto it and then says, you create it. Here are the elements, here is nature, here are the animals, create humans. And so the worlds that we live in are, are solely from our own creations within our mind. But we have so gotten life is happening to us from some entity outside of us, not from within our source, that we're living in a delusion that we're not creators. And God's saying, I'm source, you're the creator. I've given you everything you need to create whatever life that you wanna have. I've given you everything that you need to create constantly every single day. And so as this transition that's happening right now, as a collective, is that our eyes are being opened up to we can create from source. We don't have to cre keep creating dead things right. that deteriorate, that die, that leave, that don't last forever. It's not that they're just illusions. It's not that they're not real. They are real to us. We are creating things that we are experiencing. That is real, but it, it deteriorates. Yeah. It's not eternal. The only thing that is eternal is source. So when we come back to this pace, and that's exactly what we're doing. When we're doing you know, meditations or whatever, something to help you write your mind around it. So here you are, source. And then here's you know, everything else. TV, politics, whatever, um, society. So then here's all the other voices outside of you constantly. Let me tell you something. The voices in your head are not all your voices. They're not all your voices. You don't have to acknowledge them and be like, oh, that's my thought. I feel bad about it. It's not your dang thought. It's a thought that was conditioned in your mind by society, entertainment. It's conditioned by whatever you're putting into your mind. It's not your thought. So don't judge yourself. Give yourself a little grace and be like, that's not my thought. And then just move on. Don't stay on it. So what we're doing in meditation is we're removing all the extra sound. We're removing all the extra voices. All the, and this is one thing that's happening to me right now is I was feeling... Um, I was hearing a lot of extra emotions and, and noises in my mind. And I could identify that it wasn't me. I knew that it wasn't me, but I was still being tormented by it. 
And, and I just, I mean, to the point where I couldn't sleep, I was like having a little bit of panic attacks in the morning. Um, even I would like wake up feeling panicked. And I was like, what is this? I was so tormented in my mind and I knew it wasn't Alex's voice. And then I, I a couple days, this was happening for a while, like probably a couple months off and on and I was just battling through it. You know, I'm getting back in peace, I'm meditating, pushing past that voice and that voice would come back. And then I'm like, ugh, pushing past it again. And then it would come back and it would come back. And so finally one morning, we were about to move and um, where I've been at for the past, you know, eight months was in this very small apartment. It's very dark in there. Um, it's a very small space and it's me, Joni, uh, midnight, the dog, <laughs> and I was feeling very confined, but I knew it was where I needed to be because I was facing myself. I was facing the voices that I was hearing because I had nothing else to do, you know, me and Joni, and, and so I had to face that voice. I'm like, okay, what is this? And a lot of Joni's voice as well. <laughs> and so the day that we're moving, and I've been telling, you know, I, I was talking with myself, and I'm like, okay, this move is going to be a transition from leaving this place behind and moving into the new. And I've been dealing with what I've been dealing with. I've been allowing the healing, allowing the process, returning back to source. And that morning, my sister's texting me and calling me, and my mom's calling me. And I start to call my sister, and, and I'm just giving her a download that God was speaking to me right in that moment. Gen and, and we've been talking about generational. So then I call my mom, and she starts telling me, she starts speaking to me, telling me things that she's dealt with in the past. And all of a sudden, a voice was identified. It was never my voice. It was a generational voice. And I was like, okay, so that's why it feel, felt so strong, so tormenting. Because it wasn't, when it's generationally passed down, there's more power to it. Yeah. But there's also more power behind it. So as she started to identify that voice within me, I said, oh my gosh, that it really is not me. It really is coming from something deeper. And so then I just went there and I allowed it and I said, God, I, I, I cut that off now. I cut that from me, I cut that from my mom, my grandma, my great, I, I, I stopped that voice and I don't allow that torment anymore. And I knew it was God speaking to me about breaking generational curses because things are passed down generationally, whether we like it or not. I mean, look at it in the physical world, sicknesses are passed down, it's hereditary, right? Things are passed down generationally. So all the voices that you're hearing right now is to identify the healing that you need to allow within your family or the healing that you need to allow within yourself. So I just allowed that healing right there in that moment. And I'm crying, she, she's talking and I'm just crying. And in that moment, I'm not saying anything, I'm just allowing it to wash over me, allowing that tormenting voice to go. It's not, my, it's not for me, it's not for her, it's not our portion, it's not how we're supposed to live our lives, but it was something that has been passed down. And so I'm breaking that as she's talking to me, and I'm just crying. I don't even know if she knew I was crying. But what's happening right now is, is we're meditation, what that does is it just brings you back. It turns off all the other voices, and it gets you into a place where you can hear source, where you can hear your true self, where you can hear God and you can identify that voice. That's all that it is. Some people want to... It's been something scary in religion because they didn't understand it. It's literally just turning off every other voice and saying, okay, hold on, let me get back into hearing from source because that's the only place that I want to create from. And so when I'm challenging people to meditate every day or I'm challenging you to get in that state of mind every day, I'm saying do it every day. Start your day out from creating from source from the moment that you wake up because you're going to create your day no matter what. what where do you want to create it from? Do you want to create it from this source or do you want to create it from this source? Because you are creating your day whether you like it or not. Even if it's happening to you, you're creating that victim mentality. You're creating these cycles that are reoccurring in your life. But guess what? They're reoccurring for you to wake up to say, hold on a second. The voices were getting so loud, I was having to the point where I'm having panic attacks because they were trying to be heard so that they could be broken, so they could be released from who I am because they're not who I am. So they're litigating, when you're starting to feel so much fear or so much torment, it's asking you, please identify me and release me so that you can come back into source and within oneness. But instead, you know, we're like, oh, I just feel so much fear. I want to get away from it. Lean into it. Where is that coming from? Let me, let me tune into the source voice and recognize. And when you're in source, you can recognize where everything is in the likeness of God. 
because God sees everything. He, he, he gave human nature the ability to make their own perceptions. You don't have one, if you had only one perception, you would not be in the likeness of God. So he had to show you everything. He had to show you limitations. He had to show you boundaries. He had to show you fear. Because without it, you are not like God because he can experience everything. So, so can you. Now, what you want to experience is determined by what you are creating. It's about determining the voices that you are listening to. If you're listening to all the outside voices, then congratulations, you're going to live your life from these outside voices. You're going to live your life conditioned by society. You're going to live your life conditioned by the politics or how people feel around you or whatever sickness you're hearing about. That is what you are conditioning your mind to think. But we have the ability to come right back into source in a few seconds and literally you're entering, you're allowing your brain waves to relax. They come into alpha and all of a sudden your body starts to heal itself. All of a sudden, your body starts to renew itself. Stress, sickness starts to just calm off your body because you're into source. You're on the brainwave that God's on the brainwave of. He's like, come on, come a little deeper. Let's go to Delta. Let's go to, all you're doing is you're, you're putting your mind back onto source. You're going to create no matter what it is that you are creating. But which place do you want to create from? And when I, I always struggled as a kid reading about Adam and Eve or listening to Adam and Eve because it felt like God was out of control. And it, and it felt like, well, that wasn't his plan and this is what happened and so then he had to just deal with it. And to me, that wasn't a very strong God. If he's having situations happen and then all of a sudden he just has to deal with what happened. If he's the source and, and he's the one who creates that whole situation, then I'm like, why wouldn't he have control through the whole situation? And also, I, certain scriptures I get hung up on, and if you're getting hung up on scriptures, I encourage you to go back and look at the original context of the Hebrew language that it was spoken in, because the Bible has been repeated and repeated through different people's perspectives, and so have scriptures. And so when I heard that when God said, let there be light, he was talking about you, instantly my heart just went, that's true. He was talking about me because we existed even before human nature existed we existed within source before we ever even had the option to live our life in humanity and so as we come back to the source you guys it's not that it's some crazy you know it, look at it from a scientific point when, I, when I'm saying that about the brain waves because if you look at science if you look at the how you can actually you know lower your brain waves and start to come into that alpha, that is the place that you create. But we're typically always in beta brain waves, which means we're always in fight or flight. We're always in survival. So we're living from this space, and we were given that because humans need to survive on the planet. We need to survive. So it's not that it's a bad thing. It's not good or bad. It just is what it is. But if you want to live from that space, if you don't want to live from that space, you have to come up higher. You have to get into a space where you can actually think from here. You will not be able to get there from the state of mind that you're in. You have to change your mind. I um, actually, probably like two weeks after my dad passed, I did a bowl meditation. And I never met the man before. He, was, he came to the church and, um, Steve yeah, Steve Hampton. And he won, we did an individual session. And immediately I go into like a meditative state. And it was, it was amazing. I, I, I was, it was profound. And my dad was showing me, he was, he was there and he was walking me through all these, I don't really have the language to describe it, connections, if you will. He was showing me how things were connected. And I'm watching this and he looked at me and he said, change your mind. And you know from his previous speaking that he said, for you know, to repent is to just change your mind. And so I come out of the bowl meditation and the guy was like, hey, I, I felt like your dad was here and I felt like he told you to change your mind. I was like, yeah, he was. 
And so from then on, I went on to this journey of studying and giving myself more knowledge and giving myself more information and, and, and pushing myself in, in, in to meditation because I wanted to change your mind. And when I'm saying change your mind, I'm not just saying, okay, I'm going to change my mind. I'm saying that your brain is wired and you have to do things to rewire your brain. You have to choose to do them. So when you're leaning into the fear and you're going, what is this? Instead of running from it, you're rewiring your brain. When you're uncomfortable and you stay in that uncomfortable and you go, okay, I'm just going to stay here until I feel comfortable. I'm going to face this. You're rewiring your brain. You're coming out of survival because usually you would just run from that and you're coming into source and you're going, no, hold on. What is this? What's the deeper meaning behind this? What's actually going on? So in real time, when I'm avoiding relationships that hurt me, that have hurt me in the past, I'm avoiding something on the inside of me. I'm literally avoiding my own reaction, so it's easier to stay away from that person, you know, but then that's where we stay hidden. Adam, where are you? I was afraid, and my gut was flowing, right? So it keeps us in a hidden place from God, from our God self, the God inside of us. So with it, whenever she's talking about lean into it, it's go where your fears are. It's okay that you have them, but you're going to continue to have them um, until you go to them. And, and one thing, that there's a video I watched, and the guy said it's like a, you have a gray cloud, and then here's a blue sky all around it, and there's one gray cloud in the middle, right? And then what, what we do is we ha our frame was really small, so we build a small frame, and then all you can see is the gray cloud. I call it the, the thumb sun the sun thumb concept. Take your thumb, come on, take your thumb, find a light, these lights are pretty small, but you put your thumb in front of the light and it covers it. Did you know your little thumb can cover the sun if you get it close enough to your eye? Right? And so when you lean into your fears as you go and you find the parameter, you, you go sit with it. When she's talking about sitting with your fear, not judge it. If you're, going, if you're going to redeem this, you're redeeming yourself from the God within you. If you're going to redeem it, you've got to go into it and not avoid it. Okay? And so, so in it, you're, you're, you're in the fear. You're in, in order to not live from this place, you guys hear this a lot, we say you have to come into a place of neutrality. To be of no opinion. Jesus was of no reputation. Okay, so if that's what it looks like when you're literally laying down the carnal as, as your energy or your source or whatever. You're laying that down. So then you, you get, you, you, so that person that hurts you, all these memories are going through your head, what they do, and your gut's flowing. That's that word I, I, you want to hide. Okay, but you realize that that's all coming from the natural part of you. And so you go into that deeper space, that vastness space, while you're in it, while you're facing it. And you bring the fear in that vast space. You bring the anger, whatever it is, in that vast space, and it begins to be redeemed. Nothing will be left unturned in your life. I think I'm, I'm supposed to jump out of a plane. I know. I, I didn't want to tell you that, Travis. I know. Yeah. I, I did this a few months ago. I thought, I think I'm supposed to do this. Because I'm like, I'm not, because I'm getting all big and bad, and like after your husband goes, you're like, I'm not afraid of dying. Well, then what would that fear be? So I think we're supposed to do it. Woo! Um, you, if you're missing the old way of how church looked, which I do at times as well, because the old structure, even Darren being here, and when she said no stone will be unturned, what's happening is that it's l the path, what was comfortable to us is literally being removed. That you, there's nothing to even turn and go back to. So if you're missing what was, that's okay. That was comfortable. That was nice. It, it, it was in a beautiful time of our lives and it was great, but we can't stay there because it's already gone. It's already moving on. And so if, you, if you're feeling that uncomfortableness in this transition, that's okay. I feel it too. It is uncomfortable. It, it doesn't look like what it looked like for a really long period of time. And so that's okay if you feel that way. But go ahead and embrace how uncomfortable that feels and step into what's available for you now. Because what was 
then is no longer even existing in the same form that we wanted it to. And that's what you see that these constructs that are coming down and, 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 and the, the views that we had, I know that in 2020 when I watched all those documentaries about things that were going in Hollywood with the elites, it completely changed my mind and my, my view on how I saw these people because I had no idea the things that were happening behind closed doors. So from that moment on, I couldn't even barely watch movies with certain uh, actors in it because I, 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 my mind was changed. I couldn't go back after I saw. And so you got, we're in a time of so much information and knowledge, and it's so that you can leave what was behind because it doesn't even exist anymore. That perception is gone because that perception was for that time. But now it's gone. And so, yeah, it is uncomfortable. And, and I've heard, you know, some people say things like, we miss Darren. Yeah, I miss Darren too. But that time of looking to someone else to get you there, that time is over. And now what we're stepping into is, is someone that's willing to get up here and push you. That's a hard place to be, you guys. It's hard to push people in uncomfortability because they're going to go fighting. I've gone fighting. I'm a little bit kicking and screaming, but I, I'm still going to allow it as much as I possibly can. But is it uncomfortable? Yes. Do it, sometimes I miss the old? Absolutely. That's okay. But we can still embrace what is now and what's coming. And what's happening is this is a preparation. This is a womb for what's coming in the future. You have to be able to hear for yourself. Now, if you had traveled to Africa, like when I was um, right after high school, in that type of it, it, culture shock and culture change for me, and in the way that those people live, they had to be able to hear God for themselves because they were facing death on a daily. They were facing hunger on a daily. So they couldn't look to a pastor to answer all their needs for them. They had to be able to meet them for themselves because they were living in fight or flight every single day. So they had to be able to come to source every single day. So then you see this woman like Heidi Baker who just is like this drunk source of love all the time. And she, ha she has to be that because she was getting heads in her mailbox. So she had to be in source all the time. And then she's encouraging the people around them to be in source all the time because they're living in such a world that is affecting them in the physical world. You had to be able to come back to source on a constant basis all the time. Girl, I mean, rape over there is happening when kids are 10 years old. And so we've lived in a world where we're so comfortable and you come to church and you feel better and you tithe and then you go home and you feel good. That time is over. This is a time where circumstances are happening. You have to be able to connect with source for yourself and for those around you because you have to be able to hear the voice. So when we're saying get into a meditative state, it's removing all the extra voices that aren't you. If you can sit there in a meditative state and then identify, okay, that voice is coming from fear. That voice is coming from judgment. That is a generational voice. That's not even me. That voice is society that has conditioned me to think a certain way about myself and, you know, my physical appearance or the way I should think or the way I should act as a woman. And then as you can excuse all of them. When you become aware and you can identify them, then you can also identify source. You can also go, okay, but what is my true voice? And the more you identify it, the more you can hear it, the louder it becomes. But we've spent so much time pushing that voice down and taking in all the other voices and then saying, this is who I am. And the real you has just been like cuddled up inside, like identify me. I'm waiting for you to see you. And so in this, new, in, in this new place that I moved into, I'm like looking at myself in the mirror and, and I'm doing what my father told me to do, which was speak words and frame your world and then the, what's inside of the frame will come to life. That's what he told me. So I'm looking in the mirror and I'm speaking to myself verbally out loud. Do I feel kind of crazy? Yeah. Do I feel a little bit weird? A little bit? I make sure that nobody else is there. And I'm saying, Alex, you know who you are. You are part of the I am. I am love. I am grace. I am compassion. And I, I speak it and I just stare at myself. And I speak it and I speak it and I speak it because I'm allowing that voice, the voice that is source, to be louder than all the other voices. 
So if you feel like you're crazy, and I, and I talked to one of my closest friends because she was like, sometimes you feel freaking crazy. But the reason that's happening, and maybe you feel even more crazy lately, and this is what I told her, I'm feeling even more crazy lately, is because generational voices are coming up. Generationally in our family, there was a lot of sexual trauma that was passed down. That is not my portion. That is not who I am. Whatever happened to me is also not who I am. So you overcome the situations that happen to you by speaking over yourself, I know who I am. I don't identify with that any longer. And by not identifying with the sexual trauma, I'm not allowing my daughter to be identified by it. And what is more important than our children? What is more important than identifying those voices so they don't have to face them? So it stops here. And so I started speaking to her because what is happening right now Everyone in this room, you are chosen to deal with the generational things that were passed down to you. You were chosen. It is your job. Face those things. Yes, it will be hard because it goes so profoundly deep because anything passed down generationally has so much power. But when you unlock it and you release it, there's more power behind it. So I started speaking to her. I said, Abby, oh, sorry. Oh, I wasn't going to say her name. When I say that there's more power behind it is Because of things that had happened in my family and trauma, sexual trauma that had happened, there was also a lot of wealth that was created further up. And because of the things that had happened, there was an unforgiveness there that stopped the wealth. Because we didn't want to receive from that man because of what he did, so we didn't receive anything. And so I started in meditation to picture this man. And it was hard because I knew what he did. I knew the things that he did, and they were not, they were horrific things. But if I didn't open up and forgive him for everything and open and allow all the things that he created, he came to this country as an immigrant and created wealth, but that was stopped up for our family because of the unforgiveness, because of the sexual trauma. So I said, you know, I see him, and he was kind of short, you know, and in my meditate, you know, I'm just picturing him in my mind. And I just picture hugging him and loving on him and saying, I release you from that. I'm not going to hold you to that anymore. I'm not going to hold you to the, the picture in my mind that every time I think about you, I only think about the bad things that you did. I release you. So that way, all the things that he created, the good things can be passed down as well. The wealth can be passed down as well. Because there's certain things in our family bloodline that have been pent up because of the things that they did behind closed doors. But there's also good things that they released as well. So if you cut it off, you're cutting off everything. So I allow forgiveness, and then I allow that to come back down. And it heals both ways. And I told this to my friend I'm on the phone. I said, it doesn't look like they did what they did and then they died and you're supposed to do it just for your children. Darren was speaking one time and he said, the same state of mind yep. that you pass away in here, you are still in in the other realm. They are, your ancestors are literally in the other realm waiting to be healed by you. They, are deal they still are ha holding that sexual trauma in. My great-grandmother was still holding unforgiveness and sexual trauma until I decide to release that through my bloodline. All of a sudden, she's in another realm also receiving that healing and forgiveness. And she's, and she's up there, and they're up there, and they're, and they're or up there. They're here, and they're saying, it's you. We're waiting for you. We're waiting for you to do it. And as soon as I do it, it, it breaks generationally both sides. So you guys know, now let me, let me tell you this, when you cross over, you're still being matured in love, okay? So when this happens and you're physically on this earth and you're breaking this or releasing healing, you're bringing them into agape nature love and they're, they're being matured in love by your authority. Does that make sense? You guys remember in the shack whenever he finally met his dad? And he released his dad, and it brought healing. His dad said, I'm sorry I did that. The memories are there. I'm not saying the torment from the carnal mind is still there, but the memories are there. A lot of people believe that was what Paul's thorn in his, what, that, that's what it was. It's because he had dragged these people off to prison. Their parent, he's looking at kids without parents and wives without husbands, and now he's preaching to them. I don't know that that's what it was, but you knew that it had to bring deliverance and healing when they released him also. And, and then the, the love begins to flow. The agape nature begins to flow, and we're experiencing God as one wherever we are, whatever realm we're in. Well, and you guys, this is just such a time that we, we are the chosen people to do this for our families. And 
my friend was telling me, you know, she's like, I I've just been, you know, disappointed with where I'm at and, and, and it, I'm not living the life that I thought I would be living at this point. And I said, hold on, you're seeing a very small perspective. Let's take it up a little bit higher. You're also facing things that your grandparents couldn't even face. You're also facing things that your children will never have to walk through or see in their lifetime because you're the one there carrying it and then going ahead and releasing it from you. I go, so yeah, maybe, maybe your outward life isn't exactly what you thought, but let's go ahead and give yourself some grace in the middle of it because you're dealing with a whole lot more than just your issues and just your problems. And so if you're feeling like your mind is crowded or you're feeling like, okay, where are all these voices coming from? That's what they're coming from. And they're getting louder in your mind for you to address them and say, this is no longer me. This will be no longer passed down. It stops here. And there's things even on both sides with with my dad as well, that, I, and I told this to my sister Josie, I said, there's things in the Bagley bloodline you are to break. And the torment in your mind is going to get louder and louder and louder until you finally say, I can't handle this anymore. Let me go back to source and recognize that voice again and say, okay, this is not my portion. This is not my kid's portion. I choose to stop that here. And I choose to heal it. Forwards and backwards. What a, what a, privilege that that is us as I'm crying and I'm sitting there on the phone with my mom I just felt privileged that it's that I get to do this for my family that I get to break these patterns that I get to break these things passed down and then I look at my little girl and I say you're never going to see these things you're never going to have these thoughts you're never going to experience sexual trauma and that was my biggest fear because it was passed down and I saw the patterns and then I thought it was inevitable and I didn't know how to protect her. And, and then, you know, she has uh, her, her mom and dad aren't together, and so I can't always be there to protect her. And so I had this overwhelming fear of, well, what am I going to do when it happens and there's nothing I can do because I'm not around all the time? And then I also had to face my own control in that. And God said, break the pattern. It's not inevitable unless you allow it to be. And so then I faced that and I said, God, I want it to stop here. I want to deal with that now so it's not passed down to my children. And our parents, our parents, of course, tried to protect us and things happen because they were passed down. And so they protect us out of a human nature, out of a physical world, and out of fear and control. And then it's not enough. And then when something does happen, then they beat themselves up with guilt and shame because this happened when it's, it's, it's coming back into source and saying, I'm not going to release this over my children. I'm not going to release this fear over Joni because that's what allows it. That's the open door. So I close that door and then it disintegrates like it never even existed. And then life is created by me and it's not happening to me. Life is always happening to you. If you're listening to those voices and you're allowing the unforgiveness to be passed down, you're allowing the bitterness to be passed down, you're allowing the anger to be passed down, then life is happening to you. But you're also still creating that. So if you'll notice these patterns, uh, the things that make you angry, the things that, that jolt inside where you're just like, what is that? What is that? Ask yourself. Get into source. Don't ask yourself in the middle of it when you're throwing things and you're upset. Go back into source. Calm back down and say, okay, where does that stem from? Because I can heal that and I can also not pass that down. And it'll show you just like that. It's not this begging. Uh, I remember at, at church camps, I would watch people, and I'm a little kid, and I would watch people encountering God and like laying out on the floor and laughing and, and drunk in the spirit or whatever. And I remember wanting it so bad and not knowing how to get there. And I remember one night, I'm like over here, I was up above in this, um, there was like a balcony and I was crying, I was hitting the ground and I was like, why can't I experience it like them? Like why, why can't I get there? And it was like this begging torture because I was so engaged in the other voices in my mind that told me I can't get there and I'm not a part of it that was already excluding me. I was creating my own exclusion from what was happening. And then I'm upset that I'm feeling excluded when I was creating it in the first place. And so it's as easy as getting into source and asking one question, you will be answered the first time. Now, if it seems silly, the first thing that comes to your mind, do not brush it away. Just go ahead and be like, okay. Even if it's something small and weird. Small and weird things affect us all the time. And then we create belief systems from there. 
And you're just like, that one little small thing? That's so crazy. So just get back into source. Get back into a meditative state. Ask source, okay, where does that anger come from? Anger is a secondary emotion to fear. Where does that fear come from? And if you're facing that fear on a daily basis, that voice starts to get louder. And so for me, when someone walks by and I think that they look good or their outfit looks good, that voice always says, tell them. And that's always been me. I just want to tell you. But then I would say, no, that's stupid. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know what they'll say. So then I'm, I'm shoving that voice down instead of just leaning into it and facing how uncomfortable it might say to be like, hey, you look really pretty, which who doesn't like to hear that? I think everybody does. <laughs> but just right there, I'm, I'm connecting with source. I'm releasing love and light to the person next to me and then just acknowledging their existence. That is the voice. That's it. It's not some hard thing to hear. It's the little voice that tells you, you know, pay for their lunch tip a little bit bigger, whatever it is, the voice is always telling you. And the reason it'll give you small things to do in the beginning is just for you to acknowledge it. The more you acknowledge it, the more it's like, okay, now step out in this way. But you're building that self-confidence up. And religion and even Christianity has torn that down. They have taken away your self-trust. So then you don't know if you can trust yourself. So I need to ha be held accountable by my leaders. And I need to talk to them every day. I need to have a prophetic word. I need to ask the pastor what I should do. No, you don't. All of that's bull. You can ask yourself. You can go within. You can hear the voice. You can say, okay, what do I need to do in this situation? And the voice will speak to you. But because you have had a lack of self-trust because religion has taken that away and said, no, you listen to the man in the pulpit that tells you everything to do, and then you do that, and you feel better about it. But the truth is we wanted it to be that way because it's a little bit more comfortable than having the responsibility to hear it for ourselves. And so what's happening around us is it is forcing the responsibility in us to take, to take control of our minds and our bodies and our health and our well-being and what's passed down to our children. It's about taking responsibility and saying, no, I'm not this way because of society. I'm not this way because of my parents. I'm not this way because of what happened to me. I am this way because of the choices that I have made, the perceptions I have brought into myself that I chose to make beliefs. It was me. But then at the same time, when I say it's me and I'm looking in the mirror, it was me. I made that choice. I came into agreement with me. I'm my own problem, but I'm also my own solution. But you can't be your own solution until you realize you're the problem. <laughs> so you will always look for a solution outside of yourself. So yeah, it's a hard thing to recognize. Yes, I am my problem. But then I look in the mirror and I say, but I give myself grace. Because I've done the best that I could up to this point. And I did what I knew. And I did what I was taught. And I don't judge myself for that. And then when you, can't, when you stop judging yourself, you stop judging the people around you. About uh, the beginning of last, this year, I realized, and this is an ugly thing to say, and I'm just gonna say it out loud, how much I judged people around me on a consistent basis. Just quick judgments, just all the time. Categorize. Categorize. And your mind will naturally do that. Um, like specific, they do this study where specific faces look nicer to you, so you'll be more perceptive to them. And they do it with politicians, so careful on that. Um, so your mind will do it to you, but guess what? You are more capable than your mind because you come from source. Those patterns in which you think, that's just over here. You can come back into source and it's no big deal. So I realized, oh my gosh, I was very judgmental towards myself. I was never good enough for myself. When the first, every time I looked in the mirror, the first thing I saw was all my flaws and all the things I needed to get done, all the things I needed to fix and all the th things I needed to improve on. And I didn't know why I was so hard on myself. Well, then I recognized I was very hard on people around me, just making snap judgments in my mind all the time. And it wasn't because I wanted to be that way. It was just a pattern of thought that was reoccurring because I wasn't doing anything about it. So now, the moment I have a judgmental thought about somebody else, I go, oh, no, they're a, they're a light being. They're created from the same source I am. They're doing the best that they can do as well. And then I just step into the love. And I step back into source. And, and when I recognize that and I can give that to other people, then I can give it to myself as well. So when I'm looking in the mirror and I'm giving myself grace and love, the more you give that to yourself, the more you can give it to others. The more you can give it to others, the more that you can give it to yourself because we're all one. So the more I can recognize the light in you, the more I can say, hey, you look really pretty. And just recognize that in you, I'm recognizing that within me. And your subconscious mind does not register, when you're talking negative about someone, 
And this is why it says don't gossip in the Bible, because when you're talking bad about someone, your subconscious mind is not registering that you're talking about somebody else. Your subconscious mind is registering it as if you're talking about yourself. The truth is, the truth is you're not talking about someone else. You are talking about yourself. When you talk about the politician, when you're thrashing out what's going on in the city, when you're, you're pointing your finger, you are pointing your finger to yourself because we are all part of the whole. And so when we condemn one, we condemn all. When Jesus came and forgave one, he forgave all. And <laughs> that, that opens up like a whole other box of I things. Know, I know. Because And the people in your lives, the people that instantly irritate you when you're around them, there's something in them that also, it's, it's a recognition of what's in you. So the people that most irritate you are the most like you. And maybe they're acting out patterns that you don't allow yourself to act out, but it's still within you. And so I, look, I, started, I started looking around at people that I judge really harshly in, in my life. I'm like, okay, why do I do that? Everything that I judge was within me, but they were acting out what I wasn't allowing the things that I was feeling and wanted to do, but they were. So then I judged them because they allowed it when I'm like, whoa, that's in me. I'm just hiding it. That's in me. I'm just acting like it's not there. That's in me. I'm just covering it with pride. But it's the same thing. And so the moment I release forgiveness to that person, the moment I release grace, I'm releasing it back to myself. It's like this. It's just energy back and forth. And, and so the moment someone irritates you or catches an attitude and you're like, wait, that's the same attitude in me. And it can almost be funny because the moment someone's mean to you, you're like, oh, well, that's in me too. What's up? <sighs> and because every situation that you're in is crying out for you to recognize yourself. That's why, that's why you, when you get flipped off in traffic and you flip them off back, even if it's just in your heart, <laughs> you're looking in the mirror. So I, I know that that sounds, ugh, that one gets us, you guys, but... Um, it starts with first you, the responsibility in, in me and myself, but we are here on the earth to redeem the earth. The God in us, the Christ in us, Jesus in us is here incarnate to redeem the earth, okay? So we are responsible sons and daughters. So when we see the city, it's not separate from us. We helped create what it is. When we do that, when we attach that when we realize that, then we can help recreate what it is. And I remember feeling really sad, and we're about to end, whenever Joni was first born, just how helpless babies are. Because I, I just, when I'm seeing the suffering of mankind, and I'm just feeling what's going on, and i just like, God, I just, what can I do? Like, I feel like I'm, after Darren transition, I, you know, you just get this sense, like, you're not going to be here very long. Let's go out in a blaze of glory. What can I change in the earth before I go, you know? And um, what can I do, God? I, I want to bring change in this earth, you know? I don't want to live for myself. I don't want to just rebuild something. And, and God just said, become your truest self. Become your, who you are, who I created you to be. Move fully into the wholeness that's inside of you. And it will begin to change everything around you. And we know that if Jesus was here incarnate, Joshua's, um, Joseph's son, really, the city would be different. So the more that we realize that we are in him and he is in us and we return to wholeness, the city will be different. The nation will be different. It will not be bigger than us. We will be bigger than it, and we will begin to rule in the nations. That it, it sound, that's a huge statement, you guys. But God has taken us step by step, and it's not going to let up. It will not let up. I'm telling you, in the next four or five years, the systems are coming down, which means the panic in people, in our minds, is there because we've been attached to systems of the world. Just like when you lose your husband transitions or your father or your pastor, a panic hits first. That's not the grief. That's fear, okay? Because you, uh, you want to look to something other than the God within you. But God's maturing the God within us. So the systems are coming down. So when your bank account is completely threatened and you're panicked, it's because you were looking to something external that's only from the inside of you. That there is, God is the one allowing us to not feel safe in anything outside of him. Once we're in him, 
They try to throw Jesus off a cliff. He just moves through the crowd. Nothing can be threatened the more you realize the truth of who you are. The last thing I'm going to say is if you're submitting to a system in anywhere of your life, then you're creating that system. So whether it's the job that you have that you hate or, or you know, the, 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 the political stance of where we're at, if you're engaging in that system and you're submitting to it, then you're part of what's creating it. So, in other words, you remember when I said we don't resist, when it says in Scripture not to resist an evil man? I have to realize my part in it. So, I get around somebody. I don't like how they're treating somebody. I feel that their vibration, whatever, their control, whatever, and I don't like it. So, all of a sudden, I'm not in peace. All right? I have to realize because I'm not in peace, I'm, I'm participating in what's being created. Does that make sense? <laughs> The, the, you're not going to answer the problem from the problem. You're not get from this level of energy, from this level of authority as a carnal man, you're not going to answer it. We're not the answer to the earth from here. Jesus didn't come as just Joseph's, Mary and Joseph's son and turn the world upside down. Jesus came and had to put complete reliance as a man on his father God. So he lived only what he saw. He, did, he yielded only to Father God. And from that, the word authority um, in Aramaic means without obstruction. Okay? So picture this. Let's do it like this real quick. Here's the, the ultimate authority. That's the king. He's who you want to be around, man. I mean, just to be his friend, you brag about it in the city. Man, I know the king. Right? And so under his authority, you have all these people. I'm fifth down from the king, you know. I'm 17 down from the king. I can get through about 17, you know, let's, let, we could do it with movie stars, you know. I, I, I'm about four relationships away, and I can get you to see that person. Those are re- obstructions. To operate in true authority as the king, we're not to go through. We've, God's removing the obstructions. When they looked at Jesus and said, oh, my gosh, who is this man that speaks with such authority? They were literally saying, who is this man that speaks as God? Because we had to go through all of these steps, all of these obstructions to even get to God. So who is this man that he's speaking as if he's already in it? (laughs) So if we're going to operate in true authority, the obstructions have to be taken away. But we've been okay with the obstructions. We've been okay that, that I'm, I know 17 people, to, and that, you know, if I can get 17 people, I can get to the king. Because the, the ego self, the carnal self will deal with fear the closer we move in, the more we move into authority. It's just how it is. It'll be there, but we can enter, it can be an energy to us. I'm afraid and I love it. I'm jumping out of this plane. I'm being empowered by what's trying to cause me to hide. That's the difference. And that's where we begin to mature. All right. Y'all stand up with me. Y'all are chewing, aren't you? Listen, throw out what doesn't speak to you. Because you're here to, you're, you're tuning your ear into Father's voice. So just chunk out what doesn't speak to you and lean into what does. So, Father, I just thank you for your goodness. I thank you, God, for this time in our life as Americans, God, and people all over the world, God, that that you're allowing the pressure to bring us into authority. God, we've cried out and acted like we couldn't get to you. We've acted like we wanted authority, but we've had all these little safety nets. God, I thank you for what you're doing in the nations. God, I thank you, God, that the systems are coming down and we are going to see and operate in the kingdom of God. I thank you that our eyes will see it. You know, I was reading in Hebrews 11 and all the Hall of Famers, and they longed to see it. And by faith they saw it, and they, they, they you know, they shut the mouth of lions, and they... They had their children raised from the dead, and they were tortured, and they were burned, and all of these things. And, and 
they paid the price to see this day, God. Father, I thank you that the kingdom of God, your rule and reign is here, it's in us, it's among us, and it's maturing us. And God, we just celebrate through the whole process, and we do it afraid. Amen.